Stop, you haven't subscribed to the channel yet. Subscribe now, we have new stories every day. Now let's go. A long time ago I read Barlaby the Scribner by Herman Melville. My English teacher did not offer any help in interpreting the story or its curious central figure, Barlaby, who calmly refuses to perform even the smallest task with the words I use in this story. Instead, he allowed a room full of 16-year-olds to discuss the story and its meaning. It's a good read but not at all erotic, which, I'm afraid, connects it with my story. I could never get Bartleby and his curious civil protest out of my head for long, so one fine day it had to become part of one of my stories. That day has come. My story has no common characters or plot with the original. I simply borrowed Melville's central quote and applied it to a situation with loving wives. I apologized to Herman Melville. It was on a Friday morning when my wife calmly informed me that she was going on a date that evening after work and would probably return only the next day. Her speech was well prepared, and the speed and confidence with which she delivered it instantly convinced me that there was nothing I could do about it. According to her, she still loved me, but her gaze had become wandering. This was my first encounter with marital infidelity. This theme seemed to be quite common in movies, books, plays, and even in gossip that I heard from both victims and villains, and their interpretations of infidelity in real life. I listened to her carefully rehearsed eloquence about how I was strong enough to accept it, about how it was unfair that she didn't get to have fun before getting married, about how a human being is not meant for monogamy, about how society is too strict about sex, about how it was just sex and not love, and about how she would be much more attentive to my needs in the future if I allowed her to do this. With the slightest sigh separating this nonsense about me allowing her for my response, she moved forward with renewed energy into the well-charted waters of cliches, including the notion that I had no choice, that she could do whatever she pleased with her body, that life is short and she deserves all the pleasure she can get, and that she has the right to satisfy her desire to try various colors, shapes, tastes, and sizes of male endowment. She emphasized sizes. She also highlighted situations where different sizes would matter. Yes, her selective menu did not include brain size or wealth. She was simply aiming for physical taste tests. Please note that I am not saying I was poorly endowed, nor would I say that I was physically weak or mild-mannered. Is there a modest way to say that I have at least average intelligence in a large wallet? No? Well then, know that I am a rocket scientist and my job has made me obscenely wealthy. My wife had no complaints. When the former love of my life finished her speech, I could have reacted with the brute force of a colossal beast. I felt rage within me. I could have taken on the role of Ahab, an Old Testament character, the vengeful king with a superiority complex, obsessed with defeating the great beast. But we know that this story ended in destruction. No, Melville had a better model for me to follow. Despite the ambiguous message of that story, which had been a subject of contemplation throughout my life, the meaning of its strange central character suddenly became clear to me. When my wife asked me to kiss her goodbye, I mentally thanked Herman Melville for the lesson from Bartleby. I would prefer not to. We've all seen jaws drop. You cannot go through life without moments so bizarre that you are left utterly speechless. You are so stunned that you want to say something. You need to say something. You are so eager to say something. But your brain struggles so much to process what you've seen that it cannot provide you with the words. My wife's jaw dropped. Her mouth grotesquely gave to open. My desire to continue its tirade about morality, vows, and expressions of devoted love or threats of severe retribution all boiled inside me. But somehow, the simple expression I would prefer not to was enough. Often, people possess a strength they underestimate and rarely even consider, a strength. It is the gift of self-control. There is power in control. I would prefer not to. That was my control over the situation. Of course, after I exercised this control, I was treated to a new tirade about how I was not respecting her needs, about my immature resentment, about this and that, and she ended with, you'll have to accept my decision or do without me. I would prefer not to. I noticed a crack in her armor. She began to falter slightly, trying her best to appear resolute. I did not threaten her. I did not beg. I did not cry. I did not explode with indignation. Then she began to negotiate. She promised not to stay out all night on her first date. Instead, she would come home and assure me of her deep love for me, allowing me to reclaim her body. I would prefer not to. This stunning phrase was repeated. My wife shifted from being a gentle lover to an attorney she might never become. She had as much trouble passing the bar exam as she did dealing with me, her husband. I am sure she didn't recall one of her classes in law school a year before we got married. At that time, the whole class drafted prenuptial agreements for personal use. She took it very seriously then, and the contract was duly signed, notarized, and legally binding. 
When she launched into her next tirade about how if I wanted a divorce, she would take my house, my bank account, and even my trust fund, and eventually, she would be having sex with whomever she wanted whenever she wanted in my house and my bed, and I would be paying for it, I had a simple response. I would prefer not to. That evening, she did not return for me to reclaim her body. She did not come home on Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening. The sun was just setting on Sunday evening when she dragged herself into the house, looking as though a wild beast had just chased her up the rocks. She dropped her bag on the patio next to the grill, where I was cooking a nice, sizzling ribeye. I didn't even bother to look in her direction. I thought so. You would prefer not to kiss me right now, right? I went about my business, basting the sizzling meat with marinade and turning the corn a quarter turn. Could you prepare one of these for me? I would prefer not to. Right? I should have known. Are you ever going to say anything other than I would prefer not to? It gets old very quickly. I turned to her, ready to say something, but she cut me off. No, don't even start. I'm tired. Better not do it. This is such a punishment. Tonight is going to be a long night because we need to talk about this and you will have to say something. Nothing. Is that it? Are you going to file for divorce? Two years of dating in college, three years while I was in law school, and two years after that. Five years of marriage and seven years together, and you're giving it up over two weekends while I explore something else. I needed this. It had been eating away at me for years. I thought it was all set when I married you. I love you and will love you forever, but I couldn't be around another guy without wondering how good he was in bed. I wondered what it feels like to have a really big one and what it feels like to be fixed instead of cherished. I needed to feel and understand the differences, to be the girl on the cover of a romance novel where the rough cowboy does whatever he wants with her, or where the lord of the manor exercises his rights over me, the humble peasant girl. I'm sorry, but I couldn't help myself. You're a wonderful husband and a wonderful lover, but I had to see. I had to try other men. Oh, baby, I'm so sorry. Please don't just stand there silently. Say something. I placed the steak and the cob of corn on a toasted bun, added a grilled peach on top, and turned to look at my wife for the first time since her return. I prefer not to. No, baby, don't do this. Don't be so cold with me. Yell at me, threaten me, hit me, just don't ignore me. I know I was wrong, and I'm so sorry. I'll do anything for you, just take me back. I prefer not to. After that, the situation heated up. No, I didn't grill her a steak, though I briefly considered churring something completely for her. In the following days, she tried to talk, but to every request, she received a calmly polite response. I would prefer not to. She asked me what I would prefer to do instead, to which I simply shrugged. I didn't leave the room when she tried to talk to me. I didn't ask her about what happened. You could say she was desperately trying to win my favor. The next Friday, she came home a little late, talking at 100 kilometers per hour about happy hour, a bar discount with her colleagues, where all she did was drink and laugh. Then she noticed there was nothing on the table and I was dressed to go out. What's going on? Are we going somewhere? Oh wait, you're not taking me with you, are you? Is this my punishment? Are you going to come back to me? I shook my head and gave her the standard response. I would prefer not to, and I left. I went to have dinner with my parents, who had come to town for the weekend. I put them up at the Hilton by the river because I didn't want to involve them in our home drama. Of course, they already knew everything were happy to have a wonderful evening with dinner on a river cruise. I returned home at 11.30 p.m., still looking like a million bucks. I was greeted by my crying wife as I entered the house. I went straight to bed. I don't know what was going through her mind, but the next morning I woke up to the smell of breakfast she had prepared. This time my wife didn't ask me anything before speaking. Last night was awful. You left without me, and I stayed home alone. I couldn't shake the thought that you were in town with another woman. I felt so terrible. Now I understand how you must have felt when I was gone all weekend. If I ask you a question, will you answer me honestly? Were you with another woman? Considering that I met with both my parents and my mom is definitely a woman, I honestly replied, yes. Mixed emotions were reflected on her face. She now knew that I had met with another woman the previous evening, which filled her mind with anxiety. On the other hand, I had said something else, something new. It turned out to be a good conversation. I had breakfast and taken my golf clubs, left to play with my father. We talked about everything except my marriage. I returned home just in time to take a shower and dress for dinner. My wife approached me as I was coming down the stairs and heading to the garage. She saw me in a tuxedo, and I took special pleasure in seeing her tonsils when her jaw dropped. She must be really special to deserve a night worthy of a tuxedo. I nodded. Darling, I must say that no one compares to you when you dress like this. All our anniversary dinners were unforgettable. She's a lucky girl, whoever she is. I suppose you don't want to share with me. I would prefer not to. Well, I understand. I understand that I messed up. 
I understand that I pushed you aside and then spent the weekend humiliating you. I never should have done that. My wife's account of her weekend continued. I will always regret this. Friday's date brought me a burger from a fast food joint on the way to a concert. He told me we had great seats, so I dressed well. You saw me. I looked cute. It turned out that our seats were so far from the stage that I couldn't see the performers even with binoculars, and he made me buy the beer. Well, I drove all the way. It was my car, my gas, and then I bought dinner. In short, my first date on my big adventure was with the cheapest jerk in the state. On the way home, he started groping me, so when we got to our neighborhood, I waited until he stopped at a red light at an intersection, jumped out of the car, and went to a restaurant where a blues band was playing. The jerk tried to follow me, but you know Eric, the bouncer who works there when they have live bands. I told him that this guy was a creep and was stalking me. Can you imagine? Following me like I promised him something. When I entered the restaurant, I saw a familiar guy from work. He was there with friends, so we hung out, and I went home with him. But he was so drunk that I had to drive his car myself, and when we got to his place, it turned out that he had the worst whiskey, and his was so tiny. Then he just passed out, and I had to sleep on his couch. In the morning, he woke up crawling over me, saying he'd make it up to me. I mentioned that my husband is over 20 centimeters long and asked how he would compare to that. That's when I really felt like an idiot. Instead of looking at things clearly and finally appreciating what I had at home and coming back to you, I decided that I needed to affirm my femininity and sexuality, so I went to a bar. I was about to sleep with some guy, but then his wife burst in. She was furious, her face red. To throw her off the scent, I slapped him and yelled, you're married. Ironically, I hadn't taken off my rings. Then I went to the clan shack on the beach. There, a man approached me, flirting like crazy. He was so charming. He kept the conversation going, and he could look me in the eyes instead of just ogling my body. I was about to fall for his charm when two small children ran up to the table shouting, Grandpa, Grandpa, there you are. I can't tell you how quickly he disappeared. In the end, I rented a room in an old motel near the clan shack, bought a bottle of wine, and went out on the balcony to drink and quietly think. It turned out that on the terrace right below me was a table full of single and divorced women, and their conversation turned to men. They started sharing their dating failures, naming names and giving details. It seemed my experiences were quite common. Misogynists, methods, old perverts, and cheap bastards. That's how they described men. Well, I can't blame them much for that. I mean, a girl can hardly expect a man to treat her as an equal and pay for everything. These women on the terrace went through a long list of experiences with married men and men who seemed to be devoted family men, but for some reason cheated. Then they turned to the physical diversity of the men they had dated. They talked about dating guys from different cultures, races, religions, and even different political orientations. They discussed how size is not as important as how caring their lover is. They all agreed that if you can find both in the same person, you should hold on to him forever. I almost left then to come back home to you, but I had to listen to their conversation until the end. And I'm glad I stayed. I didn't hear anything else. I spent the rest of the night deep in thought about you. I woke up there on the balcony, the sun was already up, shining on my face, starting to burn my skin. I felt awful on many levels. The guilt for what I put you through consumed me. My body was stiff from sleep, I had been curled up on a lounge chair on the balcony. My stomach was upset from the terrible food and the two bottles of wine I drank the night before, and my head hurt from all of the above. I arranged for a late checkout and went back to sleep. When I woke up, I took a shower, got dressed, and went home, darling. That evening, I left our house with the first firm intention of cheating on you, but I didn't do it. The universe was on your side, baby. It made it clear that I was meant to be with you, only with you. Please forgive me. Please let me stay your wife. Please, let's forget about my mistake and return to our happy life. Please. Her eyes filled with tears. I felt sorry for her. Why didn't feel his love? I looked into those eyes, the eyes of the woman I had loved for so long, and gave her my answer. I would prefer not to. I didn't tell her that the other woman I met with was my mother. I didn't tell her whether I believed her sad story about how her dreams fell apart that weekend. I told her I loved her because I wasn't sure if I did. I didn't say anything else. She didn't give up. She tried to win back my heart while I managed to avoid her. I traveled for work or stayed in the city after a long day. I responded to her questions only with nods, nodding yes or shaking my head no, but nothing more. I slept in another room. I ate at different times than she did. Eventually, she got tired of the struggle. We never got divorced, but she eventually moved to another place. I think that someday I'll put an end to it, but for now, I would prefer not to. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.